Welcome to another Answers in Second Esdras, produced by The God Culture, the most enlightening series on YouTube. What does Yahuwah think of war? No, not Israel taking back their land from especially Nephilim-infused tribes. Understand, that is whom Israel went to war with, and he commanded so because Nephilim have no right to exist, period. They have no territory in which they are allowed to live, and they are a manipulation of his creation. So, those saying Israel went to war, well, indeed they did, but with Nephilim, ordered by Yahuwah himself. However, prior to the flood, this was one of the largest problems. The ancient kingdoms of Atlantis, Lemuria, and others were at war worldwide, and they were destroying the earth manipulating even the DNA of mankind, plants, and animals. See, those things are Nephilim behavior, not what men should behave as. Yet we see it in world leaders today. I mean, these are psychopaths obsessed with war in many cases. And you just listen to their speeches and you'll hear it. But why? Because the days of Noah have returned, my friends. Literally, Genesis says every imagination of their heart was evil continually. That's back. We cover the Nephilim in parts 14 through 16 of Answers in Jubilees. So if you want to know more, and no, don't even attempt to debate here on that topic uh, without watching those, as we aren't covering that topic here. Such behavior will get you muted here because, well, our channel, our rules. Have you ever heard the beating of war drums, even from the pulpit, trying to justify what nations are doing? We have. Especially Zionist Israel, the headquarters of, well, Gog of Magog, because he attacked it in 1948 to 1952, originally in 1918, and it was handed to the Rothschilds, handed to them. Imagine that uh, in the Balfour Declaration that same year. The evil prince demon of the end times is already there. We have, and it is not biblical. This parable will enlighten many. The forest and the sea. You will love this. What wisdom and understanding. Get ready. Here we go. This is so profound. Open your book of 2 Esdras 2, chapter 4. The parable of the forest and the sea, beginning in verse 13. He answered me and said, I went into a forest, into a plain, and the trees took counsel. So they got together, and they were talking amongst themselves, and said, Come, let us go and make war against the sea, that it may depart away before us, and that we may make us more woods. The forest wants more territory? Wow. See, what it has just isn't good enough, really? I mean, that is the thinking. Think about it. That would require the forest to impugn Yahuwah's provision, would it not? Is that not what man is doing? What, the trees don't have enough space? <laughs> of course they do, that is not the point. It's unthinkable though, right? Well, this is profound indeed. Follow this through and you will see. This is Yahuwah's wisdom from the angel, and it will demonstrate how he thinks and operates, and how not to. This is neat. Now the sea responds, and this will ring familiar. You see this all the time. The floods of the sea also, in like manner, took counsel and said, Come, let us go up and subdue, subdue the woods of the plain, that there also we may make us another country. So now the sea plays along. No, we will stop the forest from encroaching into our territory. Oh, and while we're at it, now this is the thinking of man indeed, we're going to take their land instead. <laughs> Sound familiar? Now we're living this today, folks. Man's behavior is the parable here. 
The thought of the wood was in vain, for the fire came and consumed it. So now we have an outside force, another force, really supernatural force. So the forest never did advance in this parable, nor does it in real life, really. I mean, no, yeah, trees do grow and, you know, they, the forest can grow thicker and, and even uh, a little larger. But it doesn't, it doesn't take thought to go after the sea and war with it to take its territory. It doesn't conquest. It doesn't conquer. And that's what this is all about. And you'll see completely. The thought of the floods of the sea came likewise to naught, to nothing. For the sand stood up and stopped them, again, an outside force, not even part of the war. But check this out. This is amazing. If you were judged now between these two, the angel asks Ezra, so he's asking for his wisdom here, are you wise? Whom would you begin to justify? Or... Whom would you condemn? I'll put that right back to you. Think about it. What would your answer be before you see Ezra's? What would your answer be? Who's right here? Who's wrong? I mean, they threatened to attack us, right? So the sea had every right. And we respond with, well, force overwhelming, then taking from them. That's what man does today. Is that right? Is that Yahuwah's way? That's the question. I answered and said, Verily, it is a foolish thought that they both have devised. Oops. For the ground is given unto the wood, and the sea also has his place to bear his floods. See, Ezra got it, and all of us do too. I mean, you, you read a parable like this and you think, well, that's, you know, would make a good cartoon, right? It's kind of silly, is it? Because it's what happens in real life, and it is silly, indeed. So maybe stop the silliness, countries. How about that? See, the forest has its place and territory, just as nations do. The sea has its dominion. Same. Sure, there are natural disasters, especially, you know, flooding, things like that. Yes, yeah, sure. But that's not the point. This is a parable and not actually about trees and water which neither think such thoughts, do they? No, this is about mankind. That's the point here. This is a parable. Then he answered me and said, you have given a right judgment. There you go. Good job, Ezra. But why judge you not yourself also? Oh, ouch. Now, this is firmly about mankind. And see, this is what man was doing even in 400 BC, guys. You better believe it is the system of the world today. For like as the ground is given unto the wood, and the sea to his floods, even so they that dwell upon the earth may understand nothing but that which is upon the earth. And he that dwells above the heavens may only understand the things that are above the height of the heavens. Of course, he's not talking about Yahuwah who understands everything, right? And Yahushua for that matter. Now think about it. What was Babel though? It was an attempt to encroach. That's what this whole topic is about. To encroach on heaven. They, they wanted to advance on heaven. They wanted to conquer heaven. I mean, they couldn't, was it enough to conquer your neighbor? Was it enough to conquer other nations? They wanted to go after heaven too. <laughs> now, did it happen? No. But they tried. What was the mating of angels with human women? Really? The same. It's that same encroachment. This is the way of the Nephilim. Now, it all comes down to encroachment, which is not Yahuwah's way. That's the point here. Yes, that goes for your property as well. It also goes for China, who is trying to steal land and resources in the South China Sea especially, but really from most of its neighbors, it seems. I mean, that, that's just encroachment. That's all it is. It's not theirs by law, not by history, not even in ruling in the court. Yet they're still there. And, you know, well, they'll pay the price for that. Now, the angel clarifies all of this, which 
He does so well in this book in so many exchanges. We really wanted to share this parable because we thought that it was so profound. Uh, So let's continue. The New Age Will Make All Things Clear. That's the title for this section. Really cool. Then I answered and said, I beseech you, O Yahuwah, let me have understanding. So Ezra's always asking for understanding of all of these things throughout this book. It's amazing. And good for him. That's the way we should all be. For it was not my mind to be curious of the high things, but of such as pass by us daily. See, he's hyper-focused. He's hyper-focused on Israel and only Israel. It's all he can think of and to a fault, which he's called out several times in this book for. We can all learn from that. Namely, wherefore, Israel is given up as a reproach to the heathen. Why? Is that right? Yes, it is. It's called judgment and it's righteousness. It's righteous judgment. And for what cause the people whom you have loved is given over unto ungodly nations? And why the law of our forefathers is brought to not to nothing? And the written covenants come to none effect. Well, as we're forgetting, they broke the covenant. (laughs) So they're the ones that brought this on. The consequence was already laid out. It was well, I mean, read the Torah, read what Moses wrote. Many times over, he's saying, here's what will happen if you break your side of the covenant. That's exactly what happened. A valid question, though, from Ezra, who, however, is corrected several times, again, for having the wrong perspective, Because he hyper-focuses on Israel and not understanding Yahuwah's ways. Which really is the rebuke of this whole parable. Because it all comes down to it and Ezra sees and he's like, wow, yeah, they're both wrong. And then the angel turns it around. Ah, why aren't you calling yourself wrong? Why aren't you calling mankind wrong? Why aren't you seeing this from the heavenly perspective? That's what he's really saying here. And we pass away out of the world as grasshoppers. And our life is astonishment in fear, and we are not worthy to obtain mercy. Indeed, what will he then do unto his name, whereby we are called? Of these things have I asked. Again, seemingly great questions, but now the response. Then he answered me and said, The more you search, the more you shall marvel. Think about that. (laughs) <laughs> that's that, that's deep right there. For the world has fast to pass away. He's really saying your perspective is wrong from the beginning. So many are mourning for the loss of the earth, in fact, and the lost uh, folks of the earth, which will be renewed, the earth will, and no matter what any of us do, that will happen. We were told even from the lips of Messiah himself. So it is vain to mourn the loss of that because it's not a loss. It's a renewal. Now, there are many lost who will not enter the kingdom, but they cannot, and this will explain this very well, and cannot comprehend the things that are promised to the righteous. See, that's what matters, the promise to the righteous. That's what Yahuwah is all about, and that's what he's executing He's executing judgment because of his promise to the righteous in time to come, in the very end times, on the day of judgment. For this world is full of unrighteousness. So this was 400 B.C. And infirmities, sicknesses, unrighteousness, infirmities. Is there a correlation there? Is there a connection? Hmm. Interesting thought, and we actually covered that in Noah's book of healing some, uh, and a, a couple other videos actually we've mentioned. Whom was the world made for? Well, it is Yahuwah's property indeed still, but he made it for man. But which ones? Which men? Who gets it? Only the righteous folks. That's it. The world was made for the Righteous. We've covered that scripture even in Second Esther. He makes this clear in this book many times, in fact. But as concerning the things whereof you ask me, I will tell you. For the evil is sown, it's planted, but the destruction thereof is not yet come. Whatsoever a man sows or plants, 
that shall he also reap or harvest, right? We all know that scripture. If therefore that which is sown, planted, be not turned upside down, and if the place where the evil is sown, pass not away, then cannot it come that is sown with good. The good can't come up. Now, if you have a garden and you choose to leave the weeds, that's your option. You can do that. But see, there's a law that applies there because you don't want to harm the weeds, right? You, you, you focus on the weeds. I can't harm the weeds. Now, let's pray for the weeds, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do. That, that's what we were taught to do in church largely. I'm not saying don't pray for the lost. Yes, pray for them. Witness to them. Absolutely, but know that most of them will not be saved. They will choose not to. The path is narrow. Now, you may do so, but let's be clear. You will lose your beautiful plants if you leave the weeds. You are not saving the weeds. You are killing your good plants, which matters here. This is the same application. This is why we pull the weeds. And so does Yahuwah in the end. Now he brings it home to mankind. For the grain of evil seed has been sown in the heart of Adam from the beginning. Wow. Sin. And how much ungodliness has it brought up unto this time? Huh, a lot, right? And how much shall it yet bring forth until the time of threshing come? That's the day of judgment. Evil multiplies. Evil deeds multiply. Today, this heaviness can be felt daily in the spirit realm. The world is so evil, and this cannot remain. It cannot. Get that. It can not. Ponder now by yourself how great fruit of wickedness the grain of evil seed has brought forth. Think about that. And when the ears shall be cut down, which are without number, how great a floor shall they fill? What a question. Wow. So the point here is Yahuwah calls war evil, period. Sure, if you are eradicating Nephilim as Israel, then, well, so be it. But the way of the world right now is the way of the Nephilim, and it is evil. Many churches placate this, and they should not. Yahuwah does not. As a former evangelist, in fact, I've always had a heart for the law. So I get that. You see, this in Ezra's defense of the wicked as well, he as well had a heart for the lost too, although he hyper-focused on Israel indeed. But see, he just didn't get it. He didn't get the heavenly perspective, and that's what this does. It sets that right. If you leave the weeds, the evil... They overcome the righteous. They taint them. They harm them. They pull them down to their level. And Yahuwah cannot dwell, or they can't dwell in his presence, because they would die in their sin. See, that is the way of the world today. It is not the way of Yahuwah, and he cannot live with it, or real, really the other way around. We can't live in his presence with sin and evil. He will not leave the evil. He will consume them. He's made that clear many times. We've covered that in The Man from the Sea and other videos even in this uh, particular series. See, we frame the option inappropriately. That's the point here. It's not about saving the lost. It's about saving the righteous. See, that matters. That's a big shift in the perspective of much of the church. The world is made for the righteous, Yes, the lost can be saved, and let's all do what we can to reach them. Yes, but that path is very narrow, and we'll cover that soon in this series as well, because, well, this book is basically the origin of that concept. It explains that entire dynamic all the way back to Adam. It's really the origin of Messiah's words. Now, it takes it Back to Adam and explains the narrow path. And that is that is going to be such a good video. And that's coming very, very soon. Because uh, we're almost wrapping this up. We're getting very close to the end. Part 21 of 26 here. So we are getting through the series. Yes, have a heart for the lost indeed. But 
No, most will choose not to follow that narrow path to salvation. They will choose not to enter relationship with Yahushua. It is the way of the world. This is how one breaks the third commandment, not to take Yahuwah's name in vain. See, the church does it, in many cases, every service, with altar calls, where they coax people into professing something they are not truly committed to truly enter, and they're doing so in vain, taking his name in vain. They don't educate them, but leave them as lambs to the slaughter, even giving them control lines that are absolutely unbiblical, like once saved, always saved. Well, you got to be saved first. Hello, that's a relationship, not a prayer. The very notion that salvation is a simple prayer is anti-Bible. Read John 15 and Matthew 7, and Messiah himself defines salvation, and that ain't it. So what is our battle? Right? I mean, we know Paul says we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities and powers of darkness. I mean, how does this really work? Well, it's not about militaries, army, navy, air force, marines. Some will even go back in history and try to show how uh, I heard one say, you know, oh, King Solomon conquered the world. No, he didn't. The Bible doesn't say that. It says only the kings of Arabia paid him tribute, and they paid him tribute. They, didn't, they weren't his slaves. Solomon was not a slaver. That, that's just not there. He was hard on his people, especially northern Israel, and that is a fact, but he was not a slaver. Now, we are sure there are some watching who have served in such military capacities even. We know your heart was to protect indeed. There's no doubting that. However, many return from war very damaged because, well, this is simply not something man is supposed to do. We see this in especially the Book of Jubilees many times. Noah warned that it would only be a matter of time that the progeny of his sons would begin making war again, just like the Nephilim before the flood. That's their way. That's not Yahuwah's way. Here's our battle. Here's how it works from 2nd Esther's. Turn to chapter 7, verse 57. Then he answered me and said, This is the condition of the battle, which man that is born upon the earth shall fight. The true battle, forget what the media and governments tell you, they don't know what they're doing, uh, is Nephilim in many cases, although some do and do it anyway. That if he be overcome, he shall suffer as you have said. Now this, Ezra had actually said, basically the suffering of those overcome. But if he get the victory, he shall receive the thing that I say. Now, this is the process of relationship with Yahusha, ultimately. You have to fight for it. It's free, but no, it is not easy. Anyone that says this is easy is a liar. This is a literal definition of salvation, essentially, one that we can bank on. It's not a prayer. It's a lifestyle. It's a battle. Folks, if you aren't battling spiritually, well, you're not putting on your armor, as Paul said we should. So we're not even understanding the concept. His armor is not that of swords and shields and nuclear weapons. No, that's not his armor. And he doesn't need any of those things, nor is he talking about those in prophecy, really. But if you're not, then, then there's a strong question that you are even saved. Ezra had to be taught this. In fact, this is wisdom from Yahuwah. For this is the life whereof Moses spoke unto the people while he lived, saying, Choose you life, that you may live. Now, we have to choose life. See, we have choice to make. We can't choose death and its lifestyle and call ourselves living. We are not. We are dead. The law of life is our lifeline. Our relationship with him is all that matters. It's not about an organization, nor membership, not a pretty building, nor great infrastructure. Those are all vanity and not biblical pursuits even. They're just not even there. Life, choosing life, is entering true relationship with Yahusha. Again, John 15, Matthew 7, read them. But here is the reality. 
Nevertheless, they believed him not, nor yet the prophets after him. No, nor me, which have spoken unto them, that there should not be such heaviness in their destruction, as shall be joy over them that are persuaded to salvation. We are to persuade those to salvation, yes, not coax, and again, not redefine it into an, an elementary lie, which most of the church has done at this point. Man doesn't listen very well. This is how we get an entire church system, which does not even know the word. They want their ears tickled to be told what they want to hear. Sure, that feels better. I get it. But you won't get that here. The remnant is a mature group. It's not any church, period. It has nothing to do with a church, a building, an organization. None of that. These are in true relationship with him, and they don't war. If someone attacks your house, do you defend yourself? Well, absolutely. But that's not what nations are doing. The U.S. and U.N., they don't just bomb a place like Iraq into oblivion. They take from it. They gain from it. That's how it really works behind the scenes. In the colonial days, they were very blatant, and they took everything in the open and didn't even apologize for it. And today, they're still not apologizing for it. The Pope should be begging forgiveness to the whole earth for the things that he's done. Uh, his position, his office, his, his religion uh, have done in the name of his God, whoever that is, because it certainly is not the one of the Bible, all the land, all the resources, everything. Today, they work hard to appear to do so because they enslave the people in a more clever way, witchcraft, essentially, through economies, through false money called currency. Well, it's just magic because it's not real money. It's only perceived value. That's all that it holds. And they control that perception. So that's not a good system, no matter how you shake it. There are economic hitmen who go into poor nations to entrap them in debt. They know they will never repay so that they can then take their resources. That's how it works. This is the way of the world. This is the way of the U.S. It is the way of the U.N. It is the way of Israel. It is the way that the world operates right now. And it's not Yahuwah's way. He hates it, as this parable shows you. He does not operate that way, and he judges it unrighteous. That's what this parable just said. You saw that yourself. And there you have it, the parable of the forest and the sea, the story of mankind and behavior not found in forest and seas generally. This is a rebuke of most controlling nations and how they behave, and colonialism especially. Notice how it is the accepted way of life today, even in the church. In fact, there are churches who have behaved in such manner, such as the Catholic Church, who was a conqueror, and many would say remains so. That's not his, and they don't know him, nor his ways. They don't represent Yahuwah. Now that is profound indeed. We hope all have learned from this impactful video and that we all restore Yahuwah's ways in true relationship with Him, which is what it's all about, folks. That's what we've got. Now, we have over 365 videos on this channel. That's one for every day of the year now. Many just as profound, with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, and now six in Spanish to start. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads because somehow we get thousands of new subscribers and yet somehow lose notifications. I don't know how that works, but join our email list as YouTube does seem to just have trouble notifying. It's just too hard. And we will notify you ourselves. Just go to thegodculture.com and fill in the pop-up 
We now have alternative platforms to YouTube for videos on Rumble and Utreon, and our new podcast is also available for all of our videos as well. All links are in the description box. Friend us on Facebook at The God Culture Space Hyphen Space Original. If you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor link below. We now have five books published internationally being read now in over 100 countries with our new release available, Rest, the 400-plus page case for Sabbath. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it is available in hardcover or softcover there. Additionally, this week, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interior, as so many have requested, overseas as well, because Amazon was only printing black and white before, and we've, we've graduated the beta program at this point, and it seems like we can now do it in color, and everything's working out. We already have that in the Philippines, by the way, so if you bought a copy in the Philippines, obviously the maps are already color. That, too, is available in hardcover or softcover on Amazon, if you wish. All books, including Solomon's Treasure, are now free in ebook. Just go to ophirinstitute.com for all the links for all of those things for your area, for all books and ebooks. More coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone. In 400 BC, the prophet Ezra predicted, For my son Yahushua shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. Essentially, 0 BC, the era Messiah was born, and by his very name, in exactness. After these years shall my son Messiah die, and all men that have life. 
the origin of John 3.16. And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the signs shall happen which I showed you before. And then shall my son be declared, whom you saw as a man ascending. Even the end times are defined long before the book of Revelation, the son of Elohim being confessed in the world. After seven days, the world will be raised up, mass resurrection of those who are asleep, the judgment seat, evil will disappear. The Lion of Yehuda will consume the final empire, consuming his enemies with fire from his mouth. The lost tribes return. Every eye shall see him handing out crowns and giving palms. The road to salvation is a narrow gate. Few are saved. The Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life are opened in the end. He is not willing that any should perish. The signs of the end times and origin of Matthew 24 in part. These are just some of the many prophecies in the book of Second Esdras, long before the book of Revelation was conceived. Second Ezra, written before John's revelation. This is the interpretation of the dream which you saw, and whereby you only are here lightened. For you have forsaken your own way, and applied your diligence unto my law, and sought it. That's Yahuwah speaking to the prophet Ezra. Second Ezra is dated at least 1st century B.C., as it is used to interpret Habakkuk and blessing of the prince of the congregation who is Messiah. This includes a radiocarbon dating testing uh, as well of one fragment from 120 to 5 B.C. We cover this in the introduction. This book includes 1st Esdras as well, which is also dated to the 1st century BC, when one examines what is called in fraud the Proto-Ester fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which do not remotely fit Esther, but are a match to 1st Esdras. We cover this in the introduction of this book, as well as on our YouTube uh, videos on Esther in the original canon series. Second Esdras was quoted by Messiah according to the original authorized 1611 King James Version. Matthew 23, 37, and 38 is a direct quote from Second Esdras. Esdras, which is anchored right there in the margin note as the origin of Messiah's words. For Esdras is second Esdras, which we explain in the introduction. Yes, he quoted second Esdras multiple times. When accurately dated, 2nd Esdras proves the origin of significant doctrine in the New Testament. We cover many such instances in the introduction. There is a reason why these two books remain in some Bible canons to this day. They test as inspired scripture. Test them for yourself. Get your copy now, free in ebook. Again, this content is free. If you would like it in print, it is available on Amazon internationally and Shopee Philippines. Just go to toesdras.org. Download the ebook, and the links are there for your area.